Good morning. This is the service of midday prayer. It's wonderful to be with you today. I want to talk with you about this lesson from Matthew that was given on the Revised Common Lectionary. It's all about leadership and what it means to be a good leader. And Jesus is very concerned as he prepares to leave his disciples that their leadership be one that's well done. And he tells them a parable about a servant who's been entrusted with leadership and what it really means. So if you'd like to follow along, the prayers at midday begin on page 56 in the book of Alternative Services. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who watches over you will not let you fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. So the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. The psalm prayer is this. Be present to us, merciful God. Protect us in times of danger, so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of this life may rest in your eternal changelessness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. One of the short lessons is taken from the second letter of John. Dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the very beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I'm writing to you a new command. It's true, it's seen in him, it's truth. And you, because of the darkness, is passing away and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. Love one another as I have loved you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Who then is the faithful and wise slave, whom his master has put in charge of his household, to give the other slaves their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, He will put that one in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked slave says to himself, my master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know. He will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As you hear the lesson from Matthew, you hear what incredible responsibility is given to a servant to look after the other servants underneath him, to be make sure that they are looked after and cared for. And that the master might return any given time. And if he returns any given time, he wants to know that this servant has done his duty. There was a British parliamentarian named Lord Acton. He said something very powerful. He said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You and I have been witnessing over the last few weeks the debacle in the United States over the election down there. The refusal of the present president to concede even though it is apparent that he lost. There's such a thing as irresponsible leadership, and it's something that should deeply concern us. 
because we claim to be democratic people in both North America and of course in many countries in Europe. The democratic model basically says that the will of the people should not be subverted by any one person. It should be something that stands out as meant to be the will of the people to choose its leaders. And yet in Belarus where there was a rigged election and in places like Peru where there's almost chaos going on because of the lack of leadership and in North Korea where there really is very little chance of an election. All of those countries have to deal with the fact that the people are not heard and the people's will is not respected. If it happens here in North America, we should be afraid. We should be frightened by what leadership can become because dictators can become violent and hateful and difficult people to work with. If it happens in the United States, it's too close to home here in Canada that you and I need to be concerned and need to be concerned about the future of democracy. Jesus' parable is a very strict, hard warning. He basically says leadership is something that carries great responsibility and humility and care. A leader who is going to look after other people must do so and be aware that at any given time his leadership could be questioned or brought in before the light. And Jesus says when the master returns, and nobody knows when that will happen, he will ask for a full accounting that his servant has done a good job caring for those who are around him and those who are beneath him. We read every day about some of the numbers of people who are dying of the COVID-19, the coronavirus, and they are just numbers. And I often think to myself those numbers that we hear about the past and the history of the world. Stop, Joseph Stalin uh, oversaw the Soviet Union where supposedly 20 million people were put to death. Adolf Hitler we know about, nearly 10 million people were put to death. Pol Pot in Cambodia killed nearly one third of the Cambodian nation. And yet those numbers never come through to us in terms of people. Joseph Stalin um, was a ruthless dictator and perhaps even more so than many. I did a wedding many years ago of a couple whose parents had come from both Russia and Germany. It was an interesting, uh, the parents, because the parents of the girl who were German, the mother was German, the father was a Russian, had met during World War II. He was a member of the Soviet Army, the Red Army, and he'd been captured in the war and was brought to Germany and to work on a farm. And there he met the farmer's daughter. And they fell in love and eventually got to Britain after the war and came to Canada where they've raised their children. And I was part of that wedding ceremony for their children. It was a very difficult thing to see when I talked to him about the Soviet Union growing up in Russia. He said one night the NKVD, which now is called by a different name, the KGB, although they, supposedly the Russians have done away with the KGB as well, they came one night and took his parents away. He was 17. His, daughter, his sisters both uh, remained behind because they were older and he was sent into the army, the Red Army at 16 years of age. Both of his parents were never heard of again and that sort of gives you an idea that those 20 million people who disappeared under Stalin actually had names and faces. They are actually real people and you and I are hearing more and more about those who are perishing with this COVID-19 nearly a quarter of a million Americans who have names and faces. I know that many people just look at the numbers and are somehow taken aback, but when we look and realize that these people had families, friends, that they were people who had a life that may have been challenging, but it may have been a wonderful life too with their families, it all really begins to hit home with us. Leadership is a very grave responsibility. And when we give it to the wrong people, we risk this horrible, horrible sense that they will purge and wipe away people who resist them or disagree with them. I often think about the church as well. We in the church cannot be looking at civil governments, governments throughout the world, and criticizing always. Power corrupts absolutely for us as well. 
Clergy have always been in a position of authority and some of them of power. There's been a report the Vatican just released about Cardinal McCarrick in the United States and how he abused seminarians and Roman Catholic priests. And it's a frightening thought to think that a man who is an archbishop and a cardinal could, be, could treat other people and get away with it for so long. But power has a way of somehow drawing other people underneath it into difficult situations. And it can be abused so easily. The abuse of power is a terrible thing. And in the church, where we are servants of Jesus Christ, it's worse than horrific. That film that came out a few years ago, Spotlight, covered the situation in Boston where cardinal law allowed priest after priest to be shifted from parish to parish even though they were abusing children. It was a horrible, horrible awakening for the church and many people never felt the same about their faith because of those people who wielded authority in the church, who wielded power and allowed it to be abused and people to be abused. Somehow you and I have to remember that leadership is not just nations, it's also organizations. And the church is an organization who elevates people to responsibility and it elevates them into a position of power. And those positions have to be treated the same way that any politician, with humility, with love, with care, and with a sense of responsibility. I often think about uh, a woman years ago that came to me for advice. Often I ask, I'm asked by people to give them advice. Now advice is a dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing. Because to tell people what to do is really not our role. We help people come to their own decisions. Years ago when I was trying to decide what parish to go to, I went to my mentor, um, my priest mentor, and I said to him, how do I decide what to do in this situation? And he said, it's very simple. Take a piece of paper, put a line down the middle of it, Put on one side con, and the other side pro. Write down all of those things on each side that are for, you know, pro that makes sense, and con that also makes sense. Things that would help you, things that would not help you. He said that will help you make the decision. I thought that was pretty good advice. And so when a woman came to me about selling her home, she was trying to decide because she was being offered some very large sum of money to, to sell her house. Now her house was not in good condition. In fact, she had raised three children in it and the husband had left her and so she had been unable to keep up the house very well. So it was a more than generous offer, but again, it is not my job to tell people what to do. So I said to her, you might consider doing the idea of a pro and a con of how it would help you. Well, she didn't like that idea, so she went to another person who gave her the advice, who said, oh yes, hold on to that house because it's probably worth more than they, they're going to pay you for it. And of course what happened was they withdrew the offer. The house was in such bad condition, eventually it had to be torn down, and she got nothing for it. It was very sad, but it reminded me too that giving advice, telling people what to do, using your authority or your power is a very, very dangerous thing. And you and I have to stop and think about what Jesus is trying to say. He's trying to say that if you're given that responsibility, like the servant who's left by his master, you've got to take every precaution to make sure that you're doing the right thing for all those people that are entrusted to your care. Because he may return at any moment and ask you for an accounting of what you have done and what you've shared and how you have treated those people. We have no right to tell people what to do. And we know it goes out of the way when people, particularly in church leaders, decide they know better than the rest of the church and simply take people away to another place. Or maybe they think they know what's better like Jimmy Jones and take people to South America and unfortunately lead to their deaths. Maybe sometimes they lead to an upheaval in their own church communities which divide people left, right and center. We should know better because as people within a community of faith, we draw on each other to choose and to work together as a community. We're not here to do our own will, but the will of the God whom we serve. And Jesus in all humility helps us to recognize we're part of something bigger, we're something larger, something that is compassionate and caring and loving. There's a hard part 
to being a leader also. My second parish uh, had an organist who was not terribly good, and the sad part was she never practiced. And so when we came to Sunday, it was a little bit tough to go through the hymns because so many mistakes were made. I asked the wardens what we should do, and the warden said, well, we should have fired her long ago, but we don't want to do it. We don't dare do that. And I said, why not? And they said, because it's pretty hard to go and do something like that with somebody. But we have warned her in the past that she has to do that, but she hasn't practiced and she won't seem to do those things. So I brought her into me and I said, I think you either have to practice or you're going to have to be fired. Um, she refused to practice and so I had to go and fire her. The warden said, good for you, but we're not coming. You know, that's your responsibility. We're not going to touch it. Hard part about being a leader sometimes is taking on the difficult roles, saying the responsibility is mine and I must take responsibility both for good and for bad. To say that if you can't live up to a job that you've been asked to do and being paid for, then somehow we, we can't employ you anymore. And I know that's hard, but I also know that the hard part of being a leader is saying enough is enough. I had a bishop who was very much like that, and he was a very fine and a very caring man. But when one of his priests began setting money off on his own, into his own funds, he finally had to fire him. And it was a very difficult decision because people in his parish loved him. But they didn't know that he was taking money. And the bishop did not want to tell them that. And so it looked like he was the bad guy because he was firing this priest that they loved. But he knew he had to do it because the man was cheating and basically stealing money. You and I sometimes don't want the responsibility of having to look after those other people around us. It is a hard thing to take responsibility. It is a hard thing to remember. We are not called to exercise power over people without cause. We are not called to tell people what to do or give advice to people no matter what. We are called to be responsible caring, humble servants. And being a servant is what Jesus talks about in this parable. It's a servant to whom he gives responsibility for other servants. We are here to serve, to serve God in Jesus Christ. I often think that this is an important part of who we are. And as today, it really comes home to us in the situation south of our border. But maybe here too in Canada, as we look and say, have we done the right thing when it comes to our responsibilities as Canadians? Are we taking on what we should be taking on in looking for responsible government? Because it's too easy to somehow let people in power take off and run the country their own way. You and I are meant to be people who take not only the vote and go to our polling places, but also people who recognize that politicians are not gods. They are people who are meant to serve and care. And the same is true in the church or any organization. We are not here to dictate to people. We are here to serve God and to serve each other. And those messages are tough, but Jesus makes it tough and he ends on a tough note and says, if I come back and I don't find that you're doing the right thing, you'll be put out into where there's gnashing of teeth, and you'll be thrown into utter darkness. Those are pretty scary terms. But what he's saying is you have to be accountable for what you do. You have to be accountable as a servant of God. You have to serve God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those are the most important parts of being a leader. To love God, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to comfort us in all our afflictions, to defend us from all error, to lead us into all truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that the people of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Almighty Savior, at midday you called your servant Paul to be apostle to the Gentiles. Fill this world with the radiance of your glory that all nations may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace this day to love and serve the Lord and to care for each other. Amen.